we're missing a couple, but I mean, we're, we're starting at eight o'clock. Okay, now let's start. <clears throat> May all of you be well, happy, healthy, and may you be free from all kind of happiness and suffering. <clears throat> now let's start our uh, today's section. Yeah, yesterday we have come and do up to the worry and fear, and we fi almost finish uh, worry and fear, and how, and, to overcome worry and fear, uh, it is a very important to know. Worry and fear in Buddhist psychology are a weak form of mental states. A weak form of mental state. In this case, a weak form of anger. Both worry, fear are equal to sadness. But uh, sadness and grief happens in the form of feeling sad and feeling sorrow, but worry and fear happens in the form of worry in the form of fear. So in the ultimate sense of the uh, psychology terms of the Buddhism, both sadness, grief, and worry and fear refer to the dosa anger when one is angry anger happen in a very aggressive manner but when worry and fear arise uh, the anger arise in the form of the weak mental state the weak anger when when you have the worry uh, you have to mm, see it as the weak form of anger and you trying to uh, let go but uh, this is a meditation technique from the viewpoint of meditation but the real from the real viewpoint of the life you have to find the solution as a, it is written in the paper you have to uh, find the cause for worry and trying to improve and trying to remove it, trying to improve uh, that condition which causes a worry. <clears throat> Peer and worry are two different mental states. Peer is something you don't want to accept. Something you wish it never uh, come up. Uh, when you wo worry is something you wish and something you wish to protest and uh, something you wish to happen, both are mental states. We power of anger. Uh, when you have the worry, uh, you just note uh, the cause of the worry. In the same way, when you have the fear, you also try to understand what causes the fe fear and trying to overcome the cause. This way, uh, you, you can slowly uh, cope with the worry and fear. In this case, <clears throat> you need to have a strong uh, source of uh, confidence, strong confidence. What kind of strong confidence? Confident in your personal power. Confident and the power of the, um, let's say, the Dharma or the Triple G, etc. The power of faith in this case. The power of faith and the power of your personal skill and personal ability to cope with the worry and to overcome the fear are very important. If you have this kind of strong confidence and strong faith, in your own power or in your own religion, let's say in your own religious source of hope, 
things will be okay. Uh, I want to share one experience. When I was quite young, maybe about 11 or 12, I really afraid of the ghost. Especially this fear arise, used to arise at the uh, night time. When I heard someone dies in our community, I always think, oh, that person may come up and wake me up in, in my and sleep during the night time. I have such kind of fear. But later on, that fear is no more because I know that person cannot come back. And the ghost, they cannot frighten. If we uh, practice um, daily prayer and say daily prayer and do meritorious deeds and share the merit and uh, our good deeds will protect us. And also, um, the triple gen, in this case, faith in the triple gen will protect us, will protect me. This way I overcome. But nowadays, um, there's no more fear because I understand. This is a baseless. Uh, even uh, worry, I no longer have the worry. Even though I have the precautions, arrangements and precaution and thinking ahead of time before something happen in order to prevent it i just plan to in order to prevent it i just plan ahead of time so that uh, unnecessary thing will not happen so these are just only a brief uh, explanation of my personal experience if you uh, all of us we can cope with the worry and fear this way. We can overcome. Nowadays, final situation is a big problem because of the scary conditions of the infection. People are hysterical in many ways. They use a lot of the disinfectant spray and whatever comes out, even the coffee, uh, even the uh, food, they just spray it uh, because they are worried about the infection. It's reasonable and acceptable, but extreme, extreme part of the worry is a very dangerous. It can cause mental problems. It can cause mental problems. So we have to, we have to overcome, we have to overcome the such kind of excessive fear, excessive worry. Even though we have worrying for something that will not happen if we are precautious if we can um, protect and prevent if we can make a necessary preparation this is a quite important um, in the case of the uh, worry for any unlikely thing such as uh, possible scenario of the having cancer, or having contracted a terminal illness, or death, or some sort of danger, we have a lot of thinking, a lot of worry. When such kind of thoughts, fears arise, we have to know that fear happens in the mind. Pia usually start with the thinking the wrong way. So we have to see it and we must know, even though the war, there's worry, not, actually nothing can happen because of precaution, because pre, uh, preparation. So we need to have precaution, pre preparation. We need to be able to, we need to analyze our mind. We need to analyze our mind. Our worry, our fear, uh, sometimes with the reason, sometimes without reason. Depending on the nature of the, our thinking, our uh, worry, you, we have to remove it. We have to remove it. For example, in the case of the cancer, I always use a precaution. 
I'm trying to eat healthy food and, and my and lifestyle. I'm trying to careful to not to use too much uh, of electronic stuff and not to uh, get near more uh, in appliance which can have the radiation. But I go sometimes when necessary. But I, I no longer have the worry and fear. When it is time for us to die, we will die, regardless of our effort. When it is, something is going to happen, it will happen. But we must not risk based on our uh, reckless thought. I just only explain you to have a relaxed attitude, to have relaxed attitude, uh, reasonable thinking, and um, uh, wise uh, precaution. And this way, we can overcome worry and fear. Regarding death, most people, they are afraid of death because it is an eventual process of every life. We are always living stalked by the debt. We are always shadowed by the debt. Even though debt doesn't strike right away, we are always followed by the possibility of debt. If we are always afraid of, afraid of debt, there's no place for us to enjoy life, to enjoy our daily activities. So we have to have reasonable attitude to do a debt, to all those kind of dangers, harms. What we need to do is that we have to be cautious, we have to prepare, we have to make necessary protection, we have to make necessary preparation ahead of time, ahead of before something happens. This is our responsibility. And also we need to prepare, we need to prepare, especially mental training in this case, to train our mind, to train our mind so that the mind becomes very strong and very balanced and it becomes more resilient. A resilient mind is a strong mind. It's not uh, a gifted one. We have to train, to develop, we have to train by developing right understanding. Everybody has their own time in the war. Everybody has their own good karma, even though we cannot see how much amount of good karma is with us, we cannot see. But <clears throat> we can be sure that there is some sort of <clears throat> unknown good karma, which will always protect us, which will uh, always help us to overcome certain situation. <clears throat> In Buddhist text, Buddha said, live life being guided by wisdom, not being manipulated by emotion. That the, this is not my word. This is the word of the Buddha. <clears throat> Buddha said, now let me go in Pali. Pinya jiwa in jivita mahut sita. This is what, what Buddha said in the Buddhist text to a divine being. <coughs> Excuse me. Now let me translate. Living life being guided by wisdom is the best of life, the best way of living life. So the best way of living life is being guided by wisdom. Every day you're trying to develop, you're trying to nurture, you're trying to Im uh, improve wisdom and knowledge. In this case, there are very kind of knowledge. Knowledge regarding wonderful nature of life, how to live it, how to take care of one's life, how to use one's pressure lifetime. Uh, regarding health, how to take care of one's health, how to look after oneself properly by eating healthy stuff, by having healthy lifestyle, by choosing healthy lifestyle, 
pine development or right uh, attitude and pine training once mine so that it became more positive, more energetic, more dynamic, and more vibrant, more resilient. Uh, this is a, just only some explanation regarding how to uh, develop the knowledge. There are different kinds of knowledge. Sometimes there are other knowledge, branch of different knowledge, uh, choosing the right friend, the right people, choosing the right career, the right profession, uh, choosing the right subject to study. Uh, even though you have a job, you have a profession, you have a livelihood, you have to always uh, enrich knowledge, reading good books, especially good books, uh, which are helpful in, in living life wisely and nicely. There are a lot of knowledge. The only thing you need to do is you have to find it, that treasure the treasure hiding in the book. But some of the books are really like garbage. And like garbage, you just, you just discard. Some of the uh, knowledge are just for temporary information. Uh, there are a lot of knowledge. And so you just uh, distinguish and just use your own, your own personal description. This way, you can enrich your life you can overcome and cope with the worry and fear. You can uh, deal with the emotion, various kind of emotion. Most people, they cannot handle worry and fear, including other kind of emotion. So they do whatever their emotions come up and they got into a lot of uh, problem, a lot of trouble. And we have to learn other people's mistake and we have to learn from our mistake. We have to learn from the example of the Buddha and enlightenment saint. And we have to try to emulate and follow the example of the Buddhas and enlightenment saints, how they have gone with the fear and worry, how they overcome bad situation of life, how can they live through by me, not only by means of their enlightenment, by their training. Everything is achievable because of we human beings have the potential to accomplish and to achieve. We have potential to develop those kind of wonderful positive energy and positive mental states. Um, <clears throat> this is a very much a, a training and learning process. But as said, as long as uh, we are continuing in, the, in life, we always need to fulfill to um, progress. We need to progress, not only for the other thing, material thing. We also need to uh, try to, to improve our wisdom and our knowledge. It is a continual process. It never ends. It never ends, except when you become a Buddha. When you become Buddha, your knowledge is perfect. You have already fulfilled. So those kind of good, good action. Good actions of perfecting. Action of perfection is very much continuous. It must be consistent. This way, <clears throat> we can develop more wisdom. And we can handle suffering. We can live with the suffering. We can overcome suffering. Uh, we no longer be suffer by suffering. This is uh, what Buddha's teaching means. Okay, now let's conclude uh, worry and fear section. And let's go ahead to next chapter. Now, Jada Mano and Winyana, that chapter 13. Jada Mano and Winyana. Uh, Pali words. They all refer to the same mental element everybody possesses. Our mind and the mind of all living beings who have visible physical form, bodily form, is so wonderful. 
it has the ability to feel, to experience, and to manipulate. Greatest manipulator of the world is nothing and nobody but the consciousness of the mind. It is a great manipulator. Living beings are like the puppets. The puppet is being manipulated by the mind. Once you understand this, you know how it is very important to manage the mind. Nowadays, we have the drones, robots, which use artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is just only a software program written by human beings with a human mind. Human mind is so wonderful. That's why in Buddhist day, the fast word chaita is used. Originally, chaita means to wear, but it also means amazing and wonderful. All those wonderful and amazing things in the world, such as beautiful painting, marvelous human invention, such as uh, architectural structures, and um, technological inventions, such as aeroplanes, rockets, spacecraft, machinery, computer, and all those kind of inventions are uh, manipulated by my, based on the my, generated by genius mind of the very wonderful people. So everything wonderful in this world is only creation of the mind, creations of the imaginative mind, creative mind, innovative mind. This war is very relevant. Once you understand this, you will be very inspired at your own mind. So never ever underestimate the potential of your mind. When you feel sad, when you feel disappointed, when you feel frustrated, just get it off. You just kick it off. Okay, I don't accept such kind of weak mind, such kind of negative mind. Instead, think about how you can overcome that kind of disappointing situation, that kind of frustrating condition. You have the potential, naturally gifted, born gifted with this potential. You have to develop it. You have to bring it out from your ordinary mind to make more powerful and more positive, more dynamic mind. So the Pali term Seda is very relevant term, which is very much uh, relevant to the real nature of the mind. Seda to know to where you are wonderful. Every wonderful thing is created by mind and uh, feeling happy, feeling unhappy, feeling joyous, feeling worried, feeling uh, inspired, all these things are different mental states. They just only based on the mind. Now let me explain the second word, mano. Mano means to reason, to think. Pali word mana is a to reason to think. Human beings are called the manusa. Mana usa. Mana means reasoning and thinking. Osa means plenty. 
who a lot, those who have a lot of thought, a lot of thinking, are called manusa, manusa, human beings. <clears throat> In the English word, human, the last word, man, M-A-N, it's the same word, Bali word, same Bali word, mana, man, the same, hue is off. <clears throat> it is only the some, some, some sort of the uh, uh, Greek or maybe Latin word. So Bali, Bali word, mana, and English word, man, M-A-N, are very much uh, close and very much uh, similar in many ways. So the term mano means to resent to think. <clears throat> it comes from the root mana. We have the power to reason. We have the power to logically think. We have the power to distinguish uh, between white and dark, white and black. We have to uh, Reason, because we are human beings which, who possess this ability. Now, the third word is Vinyana. Vinyana is we nya na. Three words. We means specially. Nya means to know. And na is a the derivative of the ju. Ju is a Bali suffix. <clears throat> So vijnana, sometimes we used to go in the spirit and soul. This word is very much equal to soul and spirit, which we use in our daily life. Most of us, they, they view the term spirit and soul as a very solid entity, which has a very solid power. Spirit and soul in Bali Vinyana is an individual alimia, individual property of a person. An individual person is made out of spirit and the body. We always think that, but uh, from the higher perspective of the Buddhist teaching, we just need to view it or more practically scientific term, body is body. Vinyana is just only the element, a material element which exists inside the body. Like the robots which operate through the artificial intelligence, not only artificial intelligence, um, but also the electrical energy. Electrical energy and artificial intelligence, which can be referred to as the software, special software, are very critical in manipulating a robot's function. In the same way, we have electrical energy inside. We have a software. Electrical energy in body stack inside which exists in our body. In this case, it's known as Ruba Jivita. Ruba Jivita. <clears throat> Ruba is the matter. Jivita means life. Life of the matter. I need to explain to you. There are two kinds of life inside us. One is called the Ruba Jivita Indriya, the life of the meta, physical meta of this body. And the second one is called the Nama Aruba Jivita Indriya. Aruba A means not, Ruba means meta, not meta, immaterial. Jivita Indriya means life, the life of immaterial, immaterial life. So physical life immaterial life or life of the matter and life of the immaterial nature. Now let me explain in detail. 
rubber jiwi dendria life of the matter or material life in which exists in the body is that keep our organs remain active and always remain fresh this kind of life of the matter or material life is provided by nutrients which we can get from the food we consume so material life is sustained by material nutrient available through the physical food we eat such as wholesome natural grain brown bread pure natural grain cereal milk egg fruit and all those kind of nutrition food which we put into our mouth the moment we chew it and we swallow it once it got into our intestine digested tract our stomach start working to squeeze and to distinguish the waste matter to absorb nutrients into the body this way material life sustain we remain alive due to nutrients provided by um, food and uh, through nutrient we maintain our material life so this is a, what material life is how it function this is only a brief explanation unless and until you study buddhist psychology you will not understand this now in material life or no matter life form which exists in our inside is very difficult one to explain it is very important to know it is spiritual element of an individual living creature this spiritual element can be found not only inside you not only among your friend if you go into the forest look at the small ants moving in a hurry looking for food and security got ants which stand guard at the end hill in terms of the end hill they also have the same mind the same spiritual element the same have been a feeling of have been the same feeling of have been the same feeling of worry and fear the same feeling of love and romantic feeling the same feeling of sadness never look down on the small ants they are always like us they are also like you they are spirit and spiritual element and five aggregates are very much same no different except in the value of the body the nature the shape of the body other things are very much the same if you go into the ocean you will see the same they live like us they have their family they have anger they have to they have to worry for their daily food they have to struggle they have to survive for their daily needs not only us the whole world as long as uh, they have this this spiritual element inside the, their bodies they always share the same feeling the same conditions of life so life is a universal experience once you understand that you will appreciate how lucky and how blessed you are to be born into this human world now let me continue and pick up what i said when you and material life is a spiritual life uh, which doesn't exist in the form of matter but both material life and material lives what together now here is the question how a material life is sustained 
I have already explained how material life is sustained by the food you eat. Your material life is sustained. But how a material life is sustained? What is the source of a material life? This is very interesting. In Buddhist text, it is clearly mentioned spiritual energy, which have been in the form of goodwill, in the form of ill will, um, in the form of desire, anger, all these generates this immaterial, immaterial uh, life. But among those kind of spiritual elements, the coming energy is a predominant one. Predominant one. In this case, coming energy, to explain this uh, so that you can understand who, what is the coming energy. When a person uh, does something good or something bad, such as such a, as a good person may offer general charity to so, some social organization, maybe some relief farm, and sometimes he may go to the church or temple, he offer food, he observe the preserve, he do fasting, uh, based on religious faith, he uh, do something good, based on goodwill, he then he did something good, like uh, most uh, goodwill people used to do in the war. And uh, the moment he start having goodwill and generosity to offer something, to offer the farm for the needy children, for the hospital relief, uh, action, relief, uh, relief function, and he, he start having good coming energy in the form of the spiritual flow. The moment he just drive his car and go to the hospital or to go to the homeless shelter or the and nursing home and to offer food, and to offer medicine, to offer fun, and all every action he do, and any call he made through the phone, speech, verbal action, and physical action. The moment he uh, act, generate, commit, good coming spiritual flow in his spirit. This spiritual flow, which happens when he is doing good action, is called the good coming energy. It is not in the material fall. It is non-material fall. In the same way, a criminal person, because he has a lot of anger, he has a lot of uh, uncontrollable lust, so he doesn't know what to do. So he did something bad, he cried, sexual cry. The moment he start having uncontrollable desire of lust, he start having very bad karmic energy in the form of spiritual thought. But this karmic energy is not physical yet, so not powerful enough. And then he get out, he trying to find his big uh, victim, his prey. Then he just gonna cry. Every action of his criminal act during the process of committing that crime, all those actions, what, what about what he said, what about action he did, physical action, all the speech, are uh, bad coming energy already being generated practically. In this case, uh, strong desire of lust is no longer weak. It becomes manifested in the form of practical action. Then his bad karma is not already committed toward the prey, the victim, and the victim feel a lot of suffering, and the same result will come back to him one day. So bad karma happen the moment when he, uh, the thought of the bad mental state happen, but then and then in the thought process, this is a very still weak karma when he start acting out that very bad mental state into practical action, then that karma become very strong, very strong. And that karma energy remain in the mind of that criminal, in spiritual law of that criminal. 
That's how bad karma is generated, how it remains in his spiritual flow. Anyone, whoever uh, commit good thing or bad thing, based on his good will and bad mental state, he have that kind of energy always uh, in his spiritual flux. This spiritual flow is uh, uh, very important when it comes to come back to a person in the form of result. It will bear the fruit. The moment the conditions are ripe, either in this life or in immediate next life, or maybe in many countless future lives, subsequent lives. So there's a sudden frame, time frame of the coming in energy, which they start bearing the fruit. Sometimes there's the last one, the last karma, it never bear fruit, it never bear fruit, it never yield any result. This kind of karma is called horsey karma. They are four category of the karma, but uh, we are not studying psychology. So I'm just only explaining you how the karma energy remains in the mind, or how the immaterial life is sustained. In Buddhist there, there are five causes to maintain our material life and our uh, immaterial life. Let's say physical life and non-physical life. Physical life is this worry. To maintain this physical life, we have to eat. We need, we need sustenance. We need nutrients from physical food in order to maintain our spiritual flow and spiritual life to remain alive in this world. We need good commit energy, good commit energy, uh, uh, accompanied by uh, various state mental states such as. Uh, desire, ignoring, desire and ignorance are also very important. But I always mention that if you want to be rebound in the heaven or rebound in, in such and such existence, your desire itself is a moving factor for next phase of journey. Your desire itself is sustaining factor for the next phase of the uh, spiritual life and uh, spirit to sustain, to continue to sustain in the next existence. And this is very uh, important and very delicate, uh, which, are very, which is very difficult to explain for ordinary person. So uh, now let me uh, finish explaining the sustaining source of the phys physical life and uh, immaterial life. Now, uh, now let's continue the characteristic. Basic characteristic. Okay, now let's have a break. Huh? Now let's uh, let's have a break. Huh? 9.30. 15. Should we have the break now? 15 minutes, another 15 minutes, no? Okay, only 10.30. Okay, 9.30, only 10.30. Okay, 9, because already 9.40. Okay, let's have a break now. Ask to return in 15 or 20 minutes, Sita. Yeah, 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay, now let's have a break. Is everybody in you now? Yes, please. Okay, okay. now let's start. <clears throat> Let me continue the uh, regarding the characteristic of the mind. I hope that you all have finished reading this explanation notes, which contain in the paper. The mind, according to Buddha, is just only in material form. It has no physical nature. You cannot grab it, you cannot hold it, and show it, this is my spirit, this is my mind. There's no way one can point one's own spirit, one's own mind, like the way one can show one's body, 
by biting finger at oneself. It is intangible because it has no material form. In number one characteristic, which mentioned in the notes, it said it has no material form. Uh, as such, it is non-physical, immaterial energy that is active in all conscious states of a living person. This is the first characteristic. The second characteristic, it is so fast. How fast it is, is very difficult to measure, to calculate in terms of mathematical means. In Buddhist death, sometimes the mind is referred to as the Nama. Nama is a Pali word. Nama means something which can lean, which can lean or which can fall on anything it wants without any limitation. Like the air, the air can move to every direction because it has no material form. The way air move and the way consciousness uh, moves is quite similar. We cannot set up the limit of the the boundary of the air, except we can block it by air tight structure. But for the mind, such structure cannot control the mind. There is no controlling and restraining tool for the mind, except through meditation. Regarding number two characteristic of the speediness of the mind. Buddha said in one of Buddhist texts regarding the speed of mind. Let me quote Lahu Priwuddha Midam Bhikkhuwe Chitta. Yawan Chitta. Na sugra upama pikado. To translate that Bali quotes of the Buddha's word. It means that disciple, this consciousness is so fast. It is totally impossible to measure how fast the consciousness is. There is no mitefa, there is no comparison, there is no method to, to describe how fast the mind is. These words of the Buddha said 26 centuries ago are still true. And it's head of science, today's science. And that's Sutta Purat said how fast the mind is, how it is very totally impossible to, mis to measure the speed of the mind. In today's time, we may have the, the some usage in nanosecond or a fraction of a second, etc. This is possible to, to mention by use of nanosecond 
or a fraction of scan, but it is much more faster than, than the, that guy of Mishar man. What I said in Mishari world, totally impossible to measure. It's the fastest of everything in the world. That's why it is very powerful. Now, number three characteristic. I explained it here in some detail about how natural mind is natural consciousness is pure and innocent. To see the natural pure and innocent mental states, I just uh, mentioned the example of a newborn baby. Or the mind of a person in deep sleep. In a deep sleep, a grown up adult, grown up person's mind. It's also the same thing like the newborn baby's mind. It is inactive, pure, agitated, not contaminated. This is how basic mind is innocent and pure. But the moment a person wakes up, or the moment a person began mind become active, then it become agitated. Uh, whenever it comes in contact with the outside uh, stimulant, such as the sight, the sounds, the smell, or the taste, or the and the touch, etc., then it react based on. Uh, the nature of the uh, those objects. If the objects are pleasant, the desire arise. If the, uh, the objects are unpleasant, abortion arise. It depends on the nature of the object. So just already I explained you the six doors of the our body. Six doors are the agitating point of the human consciousness. When there's no agitation, when the mind began in a very dormant state, such as in deep sleep or just unconscious state, such as a, a person in the intensive ICU unit whose mind is no longer active but in in unconscious state. The minds are sometimes are pure, but some people, even though they are in unconscious state, their mind wander off to various places, having some sort of the uh, function. Even though we cannot see the, the mind's function, his mind is just moving around. So complete state of unconsciousness is the state where the mind is in a more uh, pure, more innocent. In Buddhist attack, there are three mental states which are natural and innocent. One is the, the moment when a person body start functioning and stop functioning, and when a person enter into the death, the moment of death, when a person die, the moment at the moment of death, the mind become uh, returned, returned back to the its innocent state. This is the first. And when a person, an individual being, is taking conception in the mother's womb. Only he is uh, in the start conceiving in the mother's new mother's womb and starting a new life, and the consciousness of that, uh, let's say that that past individual being, in this case fetus, is in, in active dormant state. When a person fall asleep and remain in deep sleep, 
the mind returned to its natural, agitated, pure, innocent state. So altogether, three states, when a person enter into the process, the moment of death, when a person is conceived, an individual being is conceived in the mother's womb, uh, starting a new life, or when a person falls asleep, in deep sleep, the mind in that condition is innocent and pure. This is just only natural state. Other innocent pure states are when enlightened, enlightened saints have entered into the process of cessation for a fixed period of time, let's say one week. Because enlightened saints who have attained the, the third and the fourth stage of enlightenment, who also possess the and a higher state of absorption power, they can remain in that kind of torment and uh, active state for one week. In that state too, the mind becomes very wonderful. But uh, mostly in enlightening man, enlightening saying, they have no state in everyday life and in, uh, in conscious state is still pure. But in the cessation state, the mind is totally pure, totally pure without any kind of destruction or disturbance. So don't be confused when I mention about it. The mind of enlightened holy saying, once they have attained the, especially the first stage of enlightenment, their mind is basically pure. pure always pure, always pure, without any defilement. When those uh, enlightened say enter into the um, cessation state, it is the most pure, no even thinking process, no agitation. Now let's continue number four, number four. It can travel to anywhere, regardless of distance, physical barriers or time constraint within the flesh, even subsisting the speed, speed of light and sound. This is what is mentioned in Buddhist text. The mind is the speed traveler. It can travel to great distance. Finally, you are less in this Rome, studying this page, your mind can travel to New York, can travel to Europe, do any country you want, your mind wish. There's no measurement method for that. Within the flesh, within a fraction of scan, you can travel. And number five characteristic, it's very, the most difficult thing to restrain and manage in ordinary ways and means, except through the problem Methodical system in Noah's meditation. This is just only a brief explanation. Meditation is the way to manage the mind. For the beginner and for those who are experienced, it's a, a big challenge to manage the mind. But those enlightened saints who have made progress in meditation or those who are commit a meditator, they can manage their mind quite well, even though they cannot mean, they may not be able to maintain complete control of the mind. Now, number six characteristic, it has a great potential for a person because it can play the most important role in matters of progress and failure, happiness and happiness, being good and being bad. This is very simple and easy to understand. The mind is everything. A good mind make a good person. A bad mind make a bad person. A confused mind makes a confused person. A clear mind make a clear person. A strong mind make a strong person. A weak mind make a weak person. It's very simple and easy. The mind is everything in all of us. 
if we can manage the mind, it can bring a lot of wonderful benefits. If we keep the mind, if we leave the mind unmanaged, it can cause many problems. So number seven, number seven characteristic, it's so volatile and so fluid that it can transform its nature into being good and bad anytime. This is usually referred to the ordinary people, ordinary folk who lack reflection and who lack uh, management skill, mental management skill. Naturally, the mind is volatile and so fluid because it has no physical form. But don't um, get disappointed by this. Even though it is volatile and fluid, it can remain peaceful, positive, and refreshing, and bringing good results. If you train your mind, like the Buddha. I would like to share our, uh, what I have learned in Buddhist text. Buddha's mind is always calm and pure. He never have any kind of wandering thoughts. How he can, how he can do it? Because his mind is always inclined toward uh, what is it, what is it called the uh, Vimoti. Vimoti is a, a, a liberated mental state or spiritual bliss of liberation. He engaged public during the Dhamma talk. He engaged the public when he is invited into the city to the palace of the king or to the house of the a devotee when he is invited into the city. He just moved there. Once he sat down, he remained calm and peaceful. His mind is totally absorbed in the bliss, spiritual bliss. At the same time, he can pay attention to outside. For example, when the, the meal is ready, when the lunch is ready, and people just offer food. Buddha is also re ready. Buddha knows uh, uh, his, everything around his surrounding. Even though his mind is focused on the place, when necessary, he just get ready, preparing his ball and washing it and washing his hands getting the ball ready so that the devotees can put the food in. He never have ever make any kind of the social interaction such as how is the weather today? And how is your family? Ah, oh, how is the, uh, everything? Uh, why he's eating the food? He just eat the food mindfully. He just eat mindfully. He doesn't say any word. When he finish the lunch, he just wash the hand and the ball mindfully and peacefully. And then he just uh, put down the ball near, uh, nearby. He just remain calm with his eyelids uh, closed. He remain. Uh, his mind remain 
and complete uh, place. And when everybody is done, such as uh, offering of the food, other monks also finish the, the meal. Uh, when everybody is ready, uh, ready and sitting in front of him, uh, Buddha start uh, giving to my talk. Once he finished my talk, let's say sometimes uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, one hour, etc., depending on the condition, necessary condition, he concludes his talk, then he get up. He bring, he bring his uh, accessory, physical accessory, such as bone. He just left. When he left, he just make his steps and very measured steps without looking at here and there. He just focus on his move, his walk. He never even look to the front, to the side, to the back. Just only he just look at the head, four feet head. Even though his mind remain in the uh, spiritual place, he know there is some sort of bump and some sort of the uh, tree stump or some sort of the unequal surface of the earth. He know ahead of time. So he, nothing happened. He can, he moved so fast that all the monk following him has to maintain the speed of the Buddha. He never talk uh, any kind of unnecessary word. Even when he's eating the food, after he finished eating the food, he never say, oh, the food is very good. This is very tasty. And this is very nutritious. And the food quality is uh, not good. You are very bad, buako, etc. He never ever said any kind of comment, positive comment or negative comment regarding the food he eat. Very wonderful, very wonderful. The way Buddha conduct himself, put in front of the people, put in absence of the uh, people in, when he is alone, all the same. During Buddha's time, because Buddha was very famous among the people, which cover a great distance of the whole Indian subcontinent. Many people who are very rich and wealthy, who are also very highly educated and people, they don't want to see the Buddha immediately because they are wealthy people and they uh, are the highest member of the society and they are also highly educated. Not only that, they are very old senior, 100 years old, 120 years old Brahmin. Such people, they don't want to go to the Buddha on hearing the uh, fame, famous news about the Buddha. So one of the guy, his name is called the uh, uh, Dila. He dispatched his young uh, disciple to spy on the Buddha to spy on the Buddha, to check whether Buddha is really worthy of fame, worthy of respect. And he, he asked him to check whatever any bad or untoward manner, behavior, or anything that is not acceptable from the intellectual viewpoint, from the viewpoint of the uh, saints. And that guy is called the Ultra Yama. According to instruction of his uh, teacher, he just go where the Buddha stay. He stay with the Buddha for seven months continuously, keeping close watch on every move of the Buddha. He was the Buddha how he conduct himself when there's no one how he conducted himself in front of the wealthy people and very famous people such as the king and the prince and royal family members and wealthy uh, people. How he uh, interact to the poor and very poor people from the lowest wall of the society. He also checked how he interact um, during the, the military and 
during the public interaction, uh, he checked everything. He openly mentioned about his purpose of coming. Buddha let him stay. Buddha let him stay with him. He only have two exceptions. When Buddha goes into the restroom, this is the one occasion. When Buddha went into his private room to retire and to rest, only on these two occasions, he doesn't follow. Most of the time he follow the Buddha, he just keep close watch, he doesn't follow any untoward thing. So he is convinced this gentleman, very famous as the Buddha, is a really respectable person. He decided to go back after seven months and report to his teacher about his finding. And his teacher is very inspired by description of his student regarding the Buddha's general way of de dealing with the people, how he conduct himself, etc. Oh, so he feel deep respect and deep devotion to the Buddha. Then he began to uh, he began disciple of the Buddha. He approached the Buddha and he listened to the Buddha. He began disciple of the Buddha. This is a recorded and Buddhist text. So what I want to, uh, what I'm trying to say is that the mind of the Buddha is completely managed, not intentionally managed. It is not an intentional effort. It is quite natural spontaneous skill and spontaneous ability to manage his own mind and his own behavior in a very perfect, wonderful way. Other enlightened saints, which are disciples of the Buddha, also can manage their mind, not out of intention, fabricated them effort, but naturally, because they have attained perfect enlightenment, there's no more incidence of the anger, desire, or any kind of defilement. So their mind is always energetic, pure, calm, composed, even though they may have to go through bad situations of life. This is how the mind of the enlightenment is saying is, you are agitated, totally different from ordinary mind of ordinary people like us, like all of you. Our mind is uh, got easily upset, got easily irritated. In today's time, it has become more easily irritated, more agitated, because our minds are always restless, always going through the different posts of the Facebook, I posted by a body of people on the Facebook. The more we use Facebook, the more our mind will become more agitated and more restless. So we have to understand this. Okay, now number uh, seven characteristic. It is quite polite and fluid. I hope I will explain. Now in number eight, it can bring oneself up. Yeah, by leading to heaven even to the highest state of Nibbana. And, uh, on number six, and number which, nine. Uh, on number six, which uh, Buddhist text were you referring to? Uh, if you want, I will, okay, okay, I will write down here. I will write down here. In the middle,
Okay, now you got that uh, the name of the sutta. The name of the sutta you already got? Yes, uh, middle length discourse, Brahmya Sutta. Yes, yes. Yes, you can find it. But the um, English translation, I hope they will try to convey uh, the, the meaning of the Bali words. Okay, now let me continue. Number nine, it is the greatest determining factor in making life livable or unlivable, or what less or what why. So we have to uh, realize how important our consciousness is, how precious, how wonderful it is, how it is also very much critical to train the mind, to manage the mind. This way, we can uh, get the good results. We can make life more wonderful and livable. So may, may all of you be able to uh, improve your mind, to manage your mind, to train your mind through the through uh, meditation, through the Buddha's teaching. Okay, now let's go to the chapter 14. Chapter 14. Now we are here, mind culture, the mind development, and peace. Mind culture, mind development. You already understand how important, how necessary it is. Because the mind is everything. Without mind, mental management, our mind will be very well and cause a lot of problems. In Buddha's teaching, Man, mind development and mind culture is greatly emphasized. Now let me quote Buddhist text so that you can understand the point, the important point made by made by the Buddha. In the chapter, in the, this chapter, I already mentioned the this means that disciple, I see nothing else which can lead to greater harm as an entire mind. Yang ewa adanda mado nataya soundly yajira bhikwe seida seida bhikwe adanda mado nataya soundly disciple entire mind can lead to greater harm to oneself and others. This statement of the Buddhas are always true. We see a lot of things based on the mind. 
in our daily life. When our mind is agitated with the emotion, our emotions manipulate us. When our mind is calm and without any serious emotion, our actions and our lives are also calm and peaceful. It's very interesting the relationship between the mind and the action, the mind and the life. This link is mostly ignored by ordinary people. They always think in terms of me and mine. They are me and mine always seem very powerful to them. But because they don't understand the important link between the mind and the body, it becomes more irresponsible in terms of action and in terms of living life those who doesn't know the important link of the mind and body, they just thought everything is me and mine. When they are angry, oh, I'm angry. Then they respond, they react in an angry way. When their anger is very strong, and they act out on their anger, based on their anger, doing bad things, saying bad words, ugly words. When their emotions such as desires and jealousy are strong, they do a lot of bad things based on their emotion. This way, it causes a lot of trouble, a lot of problem, not only for themselves, also, also for other people too. But on the other hand, those who know the link, important link of the mind and with the body, they try to analyze and they try to reflect on the mental states and they try to bring down their emotion, they try to control their emotion even though they may not be able to control their emotion, they can somehow in a very responsible manner. So mind culture and mind development become more necessary. It become very obvious and very clear for any thinking person that mind training is necessary. My training is like a fitness, physical fitness. When we are doing physical fitness, we have to do regular regimen of training. We have to follow regular patterns of the diet and exercise. We have to go to gym or we have to do exercise in our home. In the same way, we have to do mental fitness training. Mental fitness training is not easy thing, but at the same time, it is easy. Not easy then in actual sense of the training. But easy if you have strong commitment and desire, a strong wish to do that. But you need a skill, you need a skill to train the mind. You need also a good guidance, good guidance from a teacher. With a good guidance, you can slowly train your mind.
In meditation, observing the breath alone is not enough. This is the only starting point. There are also other things to do. A detailed explanation of how you should meditate can be found in the meditation handbook, good handbook. To begin with, you have to have a relaxed, balanced mental attitude. You have to choose proper time, especially when you are not going to work on holidays, on the evening, in the morning, in the early morning, when you start waking up about 5 to 5.30, or if you can get up earlier, 4.30 to 5. In the evening time, if there's no distraction, no disturbance around you, you can choose also evening time after after dinner or with only just a limited amount of food. Then you just choose the 30 minutes fast. You just use, you try 15 minutes, five, 10 minutes and 15 minutes, slowly increase five minutes increment and up to half hour, 30 minutes. Then you can increase up to one hour. But uh, don't force yourself too much. You have to be relaxed when you meditate. You don't think you are just trying to control the mind. Instead, you are observing it. You are working with the mind so that you can easily manage it. When you are about to meditate, you have to develop an attitude of the patient loving mother. A patient loving mother look after her, her child, maybe around the one year or two year, three year old baby. She has a lot of patience. She just keep close watch on the baby. Sometimes she let go of the baby to do whatever it wants, but uh, she pay attention to what the baby swallows, put into the mouth, because it's very harmful for the baby. She, she remove all those kind of harmful uh, possible dangers around the baby. Just observe and let her move around, just follow. Sometimes she doesn't pay attention. When you are meditating, you observe that you are primary object of meditation, attentively, mindfully, attend, mindfully breathe in, mindfully breathe out, keeping the mind in the flow of inbred and outbred without letting it off, without letting, letting go off. You just trying to match your consciousness in each inbred and outbred. Attentively breathe in, attentively breathe out. Mindfully breathe in, mindfully breathe out. Without letting the mind go off. You slowly develop this margin of the mind and do each inflow and outflow of the breath. You will feel how wonderful it is when you are able to keep the mind fully matched into each and out breath. If you can keep your mind fully absorbed into the uh, each and breath and out breath for 15 minutes, you will get 15 minutes peace. If you are able to keep your mind fully, sub, fully matched into the each and flow and outflow of the breath, you will be uh, able to enjoy 20, 20 minutes peace or one hour's peace, etc. This is a how you start. During the process of meditation, don't think, I am sitting, I am meditating, I am John, I am Rava, etc. Forget about all those kind of 
convention uh, terms and terminology. Let there be no more Robert. Let there be no more John and Jenny during the sitting. There is no such thing. Just only body, just only the mind, only two components. The body is just sitting in a relaxed manner in a meditation cushion. The mind is that which observe and that which um, aware each mindful bread. Don't put any name, any terms into it. It is nobody's bread. It is nobody's air. It is nobody, nobody's body. The body is just body. Why Mr. John passed away? Why his body was cremated? That's, that's the body being cremated. Why in the ash come up? This is nobody ash. This is no longer American ash, American body or European body or European ash. It's just only a limit. A limit of the, this universe, utterly a limit of this universe, which we used to refer to as Robert or John, when it is alive. But in when it no longer alive, the body becomes just only physical elements of the body. So wonderful. Once you can develop this kind of knowledge, you will be able to remove Robert and John, Robert and Sidney, and in the house and the St. Louis Maba, etc. You no longer have this kind of notion. The mind too, in this case, has no name, no identity, no identity. It is not American mind. It doesn't belong to uh, American citizenship. It is without ID. It is just only consciousness or the mind itself, an element, a part of the universe, which come into the body and which can manifest in the form of me and mine, in the form of Robert and John. So during the meditation, you just develop the right attitude. There is no me, no mine. There is no Robert, no John. Robert is not sitting, John is not sitting. Just only the body here, and the mind here. With the body, there's sitting picture, sitting figure. With the mind, there's an awareness process, observing of the bread. The mind itself fully merged into each and blood and all bread. So in this way, you observe your meditation, you continue your meditation, you will be able to maintain a wonderful peace and calm. Your concentration will slowly uh, develop. And sometimes you may have thoughts. You may have thoughts thinking about, oh, this is a wonderful med meditation. Or then you may if you thinking about your home, your family, friends, or your war. When such thoughts arise, just ignore and let go those thoughts, like the way you treat the air you breathe in. The air you breathe in, you always breathe in, breathe out every day, every second, every moment, every hour. You don't have any kind of attachment. Oh, this is my bread. Very wonderful bread. I am really grateful bread. Please come back. Please don't go away. You don't need to have such kind of uh, attachment or treatment to the air. The air is just only the air. It's nameless. It belongs to everyone. It belongs to the universe. You cannot claim your ownership. If you're trying to claim your ownership, this is my air, my bread. We will be totally foolish. So you treat those kind of wandering thoughts like you are able to treat your each and bread and our bread. Just let go, just let go. Letting go is a very important part of the training. 
let go and ignore. You don't bother with it. When you start no, noticing the thoughts arise, just make thinking, thinking, just let go. Don't let new thoughts come up. Instead, you just resume your primary object of meditation, observing the breath and keeping the mind fully much into the each and flowing of the air. Sometimes you may have the pain, let's say after 15 minutes. In Buddhist day, especially the Buddha himself, give the strict instruction, unless you are practicing Vipassana meditation. If you are practicing Vipassana meditation, you have to observe the pain as well. If you are practicing Samadha, you have to continue observing the breath, maintaining the observation of the breath all the time, even though the pains may rise. But in Vipassana meditation, you have to go, and you have to switch to the pain. In this case, the pain comes up in the lower parts of the body, where your body is, is touching with the cushion. You feel like a small stone or big stone. You are sitting on the big stone. You feel hardness, hotness. You note that pain, 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 very hard, very hot, and very and sharp sensation. And your mind reacts, oh, this is not good. You want to get up, make a note, wishing to get up, wishing to get up. You feel bored. Oh, why am I doing such kind of stuff? Instead, I should go back to my room and um, relax. You may have such kind of thought. I mean, just, just note, thinking, thinking. Our mind is like a very mischievous child. It uh, behaves in a very mischievous way. When you are permitting it, the mind says, no, no, I don't want it. It protests. When the pain arises, I know, let's go off. Yeah. It will um, try to manipulate you. Just observe that kind of desire, wanting to get out, wanting to get out, or wanting to give up the sitting, make a note. Then that kind of mental state is no worries, mental state. A feeling of boredom, a feeling of uh, uh, being fed up with the pride is no worries. It is not joints, it is not robbers. It is just only mental state. When you also anger arise, because the pain is very unpleasant, you, uh, you feel anger at the pain. Just observe that anger, angry thoughts. Make you know, angry, angry, and you just simply let go. Don't let anger stay inside your mind, mental flow. Don't claim ownership of that anger. If you claim ownership, oh, I'm angry, I'm angry. This is a claiming, don't claim. Just see anger as a nameless owner, ownerless anger. Just observe that anger this way, you let go. If you're trying to claim the ownership of the pain, ownership of the body, ownership of the breath, then your meditation will not be able, will not be smooth. You will not be able to meditate smoothly. So please don't claim during the meditation. Please don't uh, uh, own or any pain or any thoughts. Instead, just let go. This way, meditation will be very wonderful process. Later on, uh, you will see the pain, that pain, very clearly. Make it no pain, pain, it began increase, it began intense. Don't disappoint that. Just continue observing the pain. And when your concentration and mindfulness are very strong, you will even see how the pain slowly, slowly show up in detail. There are motion, vibration, and there are heatness and warmness. There are also some sort of moving sensation. You start seeing it just make a no seeing, seeing, or knowing, knowing. You see all the pain. Then later on, because of your strong concentration, it's very powerful, and the pain will slowly break down, fast, bit by bit, little bit by little by little bit by little bit, slowly, piece by piece. And later on, it will totally fragment and disintegrate, and it will disappear. But don't expect to disappear the pain right away. Don't expect the pain uh, to, to relieve because you are not the master. You are not master of the pain. You are not the master of your body. Actually, 
the body and the mind are like the house and the residence. The mind is the residence, not the body. It is not the owner. We make, we may be, we may claim our house. This house belongs to me. I purchase it by paying my monthly mortgage. But for this body, you don't need to pay mortgage. You are not the real, real owner of the body and the real sense of the truth. You are not real owner. If you are real owner, you will have the ability to uh, kick out the pain. Hey, pain, I don't want you. You have no right to be here. I am mean, the boss of this house. This body is my, my body. I am real, I am the real owner. You will have complete authority on the pain if you are real owner of the pain. But you are, unfortunately, you are not real owner. Everything has been according to their own goal. Our wish, we wish, oh, this, if this way uh, disappear right away, it will be much better. We wish it, but our wish will not materialize because the brain doesn't know the language. The brain is part of the body. As long as we have the body, the brains will come. Uh, when the brains come, we have to welcome it with mindfulness, mindful observation, without shaking, without any bad feeling. This way, mindfulness will be a very wonderful training process. And your pain no longer causes a problem. You, can, you will be able to observe the pain. And with a strong mindfulness, you, can even, you will even see how the pain disintegrates in, in, in front of your observation. So you, you just know that nothing is permanent. Everything is just only in a state of flux, in a state of constant transition of rising and passing. And there is nobody who can maintain complete control of this pain process and awareness process. Awareness is just only observing it. The pain, the process of pain just happening, just happening of its own accord. You don't create the pain. Pain come up even though you don't like it. So you just accept it. You just observe it. In uh, Buddhist text, the pains are compared to the wonderful battle ground. Wonderful battle ground, where a very courageous soldier sharpen his courage, his intelligence, his resourcefulness. He improve and reinforce his courage and his stamina when dealing with the opponent, when dealing with the enemy. In this case, the pain is wonderful enemy which will make your mindfulness and your resolve more strong and more powerful. And it will also make your wisdom and your inside knowledge more deeper and more stronger. So the pains arise, just welcome it during meditation. Wondering thoughts, pain are two difficult points of the meditation. Once you are able to observe the, uh, the mental condition, barrier mental conditions and pain, your meditation will be okay. You will be develop mindfulness skill. Now regarding the other thing, such as itching sensation or prickly sensation, you just noted itching sensations are the easiest one to observe. And numbness is uh, also a little bit tricky because uh, there's no sensation, just only numbness. Just only numbness. So you just observe the numbness, numbness. If you feel a lot of pain, if you feel like you want to change the body position after 15 minutes of observing or 10 minutes of observing the pain, you can, you can. You don't need to force yourself to maintain one position. You just change your body position and make a note, I want to wish into change, wish into change, you slowly change. Once you are settled down in a new position, you resume your meditation. Uh, when the brains come back, in this case, you just observe the brain too. It's a very challenging and also very wonderful training process. So you don't need to disappoint that, but you need uh, to uh, learn how to uh, handle 
different situation during the mindfulness meditation. I mean, just only explaining you, um, but only briefly. Now let's have a break. Let's have a break. Okay. Uh, how long do you want to take? How about 15 minutes? Now let me continue explaining some basic aspect of practical meditation so that you can understand uh, who, how meditation looks like and what meditation can benefit, etc. <clears throat> In this paper, uh, I need to add practical aspect of meditation and some explanation uh, regarding the various kind of meditation so that uh, uh, you can understand uh, the basic important aspect of the spiritual training. And later on, at the, maybe a few days later, I will try to add new uh, aspect of the meditation in this chapter so that it is more practical and more uh, beneficial for all the students of this course. <clears throat> uh, in my life, there is not much mental uh, problem or health problem because of my meditation. I want to share one uh, experience which I have learned uh, because I would like to inspire you. I started meditating when I was 18 years of age. It's quite young, 18 years of age. I underwent intensive meditation practice for three months under the guidance, strict guidance of a very good teacher. And I feel very fortunate to help train this meditation. In my later years, I have some big challenge which are very difficult sometimes. So through meditation, I was able to uh, overcome and to live through all those kind of situations. This is regarding life's problem, health problem. Because uh, I have studied a lot in my anti-biological right examination, uh, during um, the, let's see, I mean 35 up to 30, uh, 39, I study my Buddhist text very intensively. Continue study makes my head uh, suffer from the, some sort of pain. So I'm just trying to uh, cope with the meditation. Then I overcome it. And also the sleep problem. When I have the some sort of sleep problem, I uh, find it difficult to fall asleep quickly. I don't mind. What about I fall asleep or I don't fall asleep? Instead, I just practice meditation in a lying down position or sometimes sitting position. And then sleep come by itself. So that I don't need to use the, I don't need to use any sleep medication. And so meditation is very helpful in many ways for health, for uh, handling with the life's problem, for general situation, dealing with the people. Sometimes you have to deal with a lot of people who have a different mentality. Some are really difficult to deal. They are very short temper, very selfish, and always looking at other people from their own view, their own perspective, and from their own viewpoint of their wish. Such people are very, very difficult to deal. Um, I can deal with such people I am trying to develop patience and goodwill uh, through meditation. So not much problem arise out of dealing with uh, such people. So meditation is like a multiple tool, multiple tool for multiple use. I mean, just only trying to advertise and promote meditation. I'm just only trying to inspire you how meditation is wonderful, how it can be helpful. And even 
if you have some sort of addiction and you can overcome, you can deal with the addiction. Addiction to the certain kind of food, addiction to the sun habit, uh, bad habit or smoking or drinking or some sort of other bad harmful habit, you can overcome through meditation. So meditation is very helpful in many ways. I want to share one, uh, one experience regarding the eating. There is a process called the mindful, mindfulness eating. This is usually applied during intensive retreat. In intensive retreat, all the meditators are required to maintain novel silence. Maintaining novel silence means no talk, no talk, completely no talk with anyone, unless absolutely emergency case. You are not allowed to talk, not permitted to talk. So you maintain complete silence. And during the, uh, this intensive retreat, my leaders are required to eat mindfully. They have to eat the food mindfully. Every slightest body manner, body action is to be observed with mindfulness. And every process of bringing the food and putting the food into the plate and handling of the spoon and fork and using the spoon and fork and bringing the food to the mouth by use of the uh, spoon, by uh, stretching and bending of the uh, hands, all those actions are to be done slowly and mindfully. So slowly and mindfully are two important characteristics. You have to do everything slowly. You put them put into your mouth and you open, you just know it opening, opening, and then you just put the food into your mouth, make it you know, put in, put in, and you just bring back your uh, spawn back to the play and replace it there. You start chewing, make a note, chewing, chewing, chewing. When you chew the food, you start feeling the taste. Make a note, tasting, tasting. If the taste is good, such as sweetness or sour or uh, uh, bitter or salty or uh, etc. Blend taste, you just know it. If the taste is good, you just know this thing good, this thing good. And you like it, make it like it, like it, like it. You just know that liking feeling, that pleasure, that feeling of pleasure. Just know it and you just, you just let go. Don't keep it, don't keep it there. You just keep chewing, making it chewing, chewing. And once you are done, you are about to swallow. Then you just note. Don't instantly swallow. You just make a note, swallowing, swallowing. When you note swallowing process, you will notice the motion of the air that comes up through the uh, throat, all the way from the digestive tract. You see the air coming up and sucking the food and all the way down through the throat into the digestive tract. And you see, swallow and swallow, and you note it. Then you start another more cell. You, you start, move your right, right hands and left hand. You just uh, hold the spoon, make a note, motion, moving, moving. And then you just hold and grab the spoon and just holding, holding, grabbing, grabbing, and you just, just scoop it and just bring it towards your mouth again. Note it, all those slight um, bodily activity. And just continue like I explained before. And you just note, if the food is uh, not tasty, you have a feeling of aversion. Oh, this food is poor quality food. You just note it, note it, aversion, aversion. You simply let go of that aversion. And you will slowly be able to overcome food desire. 
any emotion associated with the taste of the food. It's, it's very wonderful in later on. Now, if you're trying to eat mindfully, you can eat uh, in moderation. Not only that, you can eat any food, even the poor quality food. You will no longer complain to the cook, to the chef, or you never, you will never show any kind of emotion. You just swallow it. Purpose of eating is to prolong life, to sustain the body. By prolonging this life, I will be able to do many positive, good, beneficial things to benefit myself, to benefit other people, to practice meditation, to continue my spiritual path and my life, etc. You have the you have this kind of right understanding. So you no longer have the, any kind of foolish craving to the food. I used to um, enjoy the chocolate, for example, and also durian. Um, but once I lead, uh, later learned that chocolate is not good for my health condition. In the long time use of the chocolate, uh, it can increase blood sugar levels. So it can lead to diabetes problem. Once I noticed that, I just think myself uh, and wisely and mindfully, I just stop eating chocolate. Sometimes I may eat only one square, two square, that's it, not more than it, not more than it. Even durian, I can't stay without it. When I go back to Asian countries, it's a long time already, I don't eat uh, uh, durian. In case I want to, I feel some sort of craving, I just know it, and I just satisfy my craving by having a few pieces, then I just stop it. And so, mindfulness eating is very good for many eating problems, eating disorder, such as uh, uh, overeating and compulsive eating, etc. You will be able to overcome very foolish, irresponsible eating. You will be able to eat whatever is right, whatever is nutritious, whatever is healthy. Uh, when I mean eating uh, salad, green salad, I never add any kind of dressing. Dressings are just only to make uh, the taste to um, uh, both people for my uh, time. So I just uh, don't use it. Instead, I just use plain salad. I just mindfully eat. I just swallow it, that's it. So this way I can maintain my healthy eating. Otherwise, I will not be able to eat. So mindfulness eating, out of mindful meditation practice is very helpful a lot, very helpful in many ways. You can apply this mindfulness eating slowly, slowly. You will learn how to eat mindfully, how to appreciate your daily more cell, your daily food, the purpose of eating, the purpose of food. And you will know, you will no longer indulge in the eating. Indulgent eating is very dangerous and very bad for the health. So mindfulness eating is a very good way of the dealing with the irresponsible eating. And same way, mindful sleeping. Mindful sleeping is a very good thing to know. I want to share during the intensive retreat, which I undergo more than for 40 years ago, I am bright, we have to practice mindful sleeping. My loosely being is that when you are about to uh, go back to your door, to your room, you have to go slowly and uh, doing walking meditation, fully involved in the observing of the steps, lifting, dropping, lifting, dropping. You just note it uh, on every step, every movement of the, your feet. You just go into the room. Once you are near the room, you just saw that you are the door into the room. You just reach out to the doorknob in order to open it. You just make a you know, reaching out, reaching out, or stretching, stretching your hand, stretching, stretching, and you just touch the doorknob 
make you no know, touching, touching, or grabbing, grabbing. You just push it in, make you no know, pushing and pushing. You step your feet into the room. Now, what you do necessary then before you lie down and do everything slowly and mindfully. And then you, uh, you stand near the bed, make you no know, standing, stopping, standing. You just feel the whole standing body, keeping the mind inside the whole body. And you just also note, wishing to sit down on the bed, wishing to sit down on the bed. Instead of that, sitting down immediately. You don't do it casually, just do it mindfully. Once you are sit down on the uh, bed, you just know sit down, sit down, sitting down, sitting down. Then you just uh, about to lie down, make a note, wishing to lie down, wishing to lie down. You just slowly lie down, lie down, lie down, slowly. Uh, with the support of the elbow, you just lie down. You will see the whole body being pushed down toward the bed by uh, the air. It's like a hydraulic machine. The body is like a hydraulic machine. You start seeing all this function of the air generated by the thoughts, the wish. How this uh, psychosomatic air or mind body coordinated air is so wonderful. We only uh, know this is a me, this is a lying down, this is a me, this is a my, etc. But uh, during mindfulness meditation, you no longer see in terms of me. You, know, you just see in terms of phenomena, physical elements and mental elements, coordinating and corresponding together, synchronizing and simultaneously, etc. You see, not in me, not my. Once you are lying down on the bed, you just restart your meditation, sleeping meditation. You can uh, continue uh, observing the breath or you can uh, observe the rising and falling of Rome or you can come observe the whole body lying down on the bed, make a note, lying down, touching or sleeping, touching. When you are noting on sleeping, be aware of the sleeping lying body all the way from head to the two. When you are noting on the touch, be focused on the touch of the body. Let's say one particular specific part. In this case, the back of your head with the pillow or your back with the bed. Only choose only one point. Or you can generally uh, be aware of the touch of the whole body. Make it a sleeping, touching, sleeping, touching. Once you are able to ob remain observing in this observation state, the mind slowly, slowly you fall asleep. You don't need to intentionally make effort to, solve, to fall asleep. The sleep itself will come up out of its own accord. You don't intentionally try to sleep. So this way you fall asleep. Next day morning, if you are able to maintain that set mindfulness sleep, eh, you wake up very refreshed, full of energy. You wake up. The moment you wake up, you are instructed to observe that consciousness. Normal consciousness start resuming. They make you know, knowing, knowing, knowing. You start knowing everything around you by opening your eyes. You start hearing the singing birds noise outside the window, chirping sound of the bird on the tree branches. Make you know, hearing, hearing, and you just. Uh, Notice your wish to get up, making a wishing, wishing to get up, and slowly get up. While you are getting up, making no getting up, getting up, lifting up, lifting up, then you already lift up, your body is lifted up, you are already sitting in position. You sit sitting, sitting, you are about to get up, and means you getting up, getting up, or wishing to get up slowly. You just get up and you go to the bathroom to wash your face, to brush your teeth, and to relieve yourself, etc. You do everything mindfully and slowly. If you are able to maintain such kind of mindfulness in slow motion, mindfulness, uninterrupted mindfulness, very data will make good progress within a short time. Concentration develop more strongly, and the inside knowledge very sharp and very deep inside knowledge will start seeing the body. Sometimes you can even, some media, they even start seeing their internal, internal structure of the body. They even see the, uh, the body skin both skin on their skin, there are small holes, the sweats come out, etc. 
they can't even see the small pole. And then a very wonderful meditation experience. The mind become very powerful uh, because of the strong concentration. But you may not be able to develop that high, but we don't need to do this one. You don't need to do this one. You just slowly learn how to maintain this mindfulness in the every action of the uh, daily life, especially during the retreat, not in your daily life. And because uh, uh, in your daily life, you may have to go to work, but as you can maintain some sort of mindfulness during the you are working hour. If you have nothing serious to do, you, you can take rest for a few five minutes, 10 minutes. You just focus on your uh, nostril, on the tip of nostril, just breathe in, breathe out. Be mindful of the each in breath and out breath. Do it time, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You don't let your mind wander off. Most people, they just uh, grab it their smartphone, they just uh, check the message or Facebook posts or some sort of new. It causes more distraction and more disturbing. So instead, you just use this mindfulness uh, rest. Take a rest through mindfulness. Just observe the breath, focus your breath on the tip of the nostril, feel the touch of the air of each incoming or going breath. You just keep your mind there, uh, fully uh, focused and feeling the joy and the calm. And this way is a very wonderful way of taking rest. You can do it, try it. And this is a, a mindfulness in action. Finally, you are in a walking environment. You can do it five minutes, 10 minutes, depending on how much time you, uh, you have extra movement, extra minutes. But don't do it uh, a long time. But otherwise, your co-workers will misunderstand you. So slowly, slowly, you can adapt and incorporate this kind of mindfulness meditation in your daily life. You can get a lot of energy. You can re recharge your mind recharge your body and you will feel a very dynamic positive energy. The mind becomes more clear, more stronger. Clarity of the mind noticeable if you practice meditation uh, and regularly, you can you can benefit a lot. Okay now let let's go to go to next page. Go to the next page. Okay, I hope that all of you have read through all this kind of passage. Okay, ways and methods of mental development. Um, no, no, um, we, I need to explain. Actually, I have already explained some uh, of the step. step. Here, <clears throat> there are two kind of methods of meditation. One is called the Samatha meditation. The other is called Vipassana meditation. Samatha meditation is the beginning stage, beginning process. For those busy, busy people who are living a very busy life, Samatha meditation is more recommended. But Vipassana meditation is also important because without Vipassana, you will not be able to manage your emotion and your pain and barrier stage of uh, uh, experience in daily life. Now, let me explain some time meditation. Before I explain, I want to explain about the Mano Bhavana. Here, ways in, under the title, the ways and methods of media development. You, here you see the one word, mano bhavana, mental development. Mano means my, bhavana means uh, development. Mental development is a very important procedure, very important training for the, all the disciples of the Buddha. Why? Because it is very beneficial, very beneficial. Without it, life will be unbearable because there are a lot of unseen, unknown problems. We never know what will bring 
what will tomorrow bring us? What will next year happen to us? Even now we see go, go big situation. Nobody expected this a few years back. Now it's happening. Situation is very terrible, very, very terrible all over the world. Economy is in very bad shape. People's daily lives are now under threat of this unknown disease, this unseen enemy. This is the way life is. So whenever any unknown circumstances arise, our, we need to have a very strong mind. To have a strong mind, you cannot get the vitamin. You cannot get the mental energy, vitamin, capsule, in any pharmacy of the world, except in Bora's teaching. Bora has the great pharmacy. That pharmacy is for everyone. No one need to be combated to Buddhism in order to benefit by the medicine. It only need to use it, eat it like the food. The food is universal. The food is universal. Eating is universal. All living beings has to eat. All living beings need the food because they have the body. In the same way, we have the body, we have the spirit in material energy state. We have so-called spirit, so-called soul consciousness. It also need vitamin. It also need vitamin. In this case, the vitamin for the mind cannot be manufactured by the gimmicks or any manufacturer. There are to be found in the ancient wisdom known as Buddhist text and Buddhist teaching. If you learn how to take Buddha's medication, Buddha's medication has the barrier purpose. Medication for pain relief, medication for overcoming grief and sorrow, medication for overcoming confusion, medication for controlling anger, medication to manage one's own desire and lust and one's emotion, medication for sleep, and medication for daily life. You can use many ways. Mindfulness is an all-purpose medicine. But you need the right, right training and proper guidance under the wise teacher so that you can have this medicine handy and you can use it. This is just only a brief explanation so that you can be inspired how mental development, no as meditation is like the daily food. You have to view it as the, the food for the mind, the food for the spirit, to make the food more energized, more dynamic, more positive, more vibrant, more resilient. If you are able to use this medicine, you can live life nicely and peacefully. So I want to encourage you to develop your mind by proper training. Now let me continue to explain. Manobhavana is the development that development. We have two mind, two kinds of mind in this case. Ordinary mind and advanced mind. Okay, please know that. Ordinary mind and advanced mind. Ordinary mind is the, the mind of everyone in the world. Everyone possesses this ordinary mind. Advanced mind, extraordinary mind, 
is in Bali called it is a D Chaita. Ordinary mind is called Chaita. A D means special, high. Chaita means mind. The high mind, advanced mind, extraordinary mind. How one can develop this extraordinary, unique, special mind called in Bali as a DJ da. Only through meditation. So you have now two categories, ordinary mind and extraordinary advanced mind. This advanced mind has various stages. Various stage up to the highest one from higher, more higher, the highest. Higher mind is the mind of the meditator in progressive stage before he attained uh, absorption states. Um, more higher is called the adv uh, advanced mind. In Bali, it is called the Mahagada. Higher mind is called the Vipassana Chitta. Uh, <clears throat> more higher mind is called Mahagada Chitta. Mahagada, Maha means the state of the height, the state of novel, uh, novelty. Kada means achieve, the mind who's achieved the high point, the highest point. Even though it's not the high, highest, it is called the maha, mahanda. Mahanda means big and high. It is a Bali word. And Sanskrit word is also the same, mahand, mahanda. For example, a Mahatma Guru, Mahatma uh, Gandhi. Maha is a Bali word equal to maha, maha Bali mahanda. Ma means great. In order to uh, reach to that state, you have to, your mind must be able to enter into the absorption state known as the jhana in Bali. Now the highest one. The highest one is called the Lokotra. Lokotra is transcendent, transcendent mental state. The mind which transcends uh, normal boundaries, normal boundaries. It's very delicate to explain, but I will continue to explain in the afternoon section. Now let's have conclude today's morning section. Let's conclude today's morning section. Okay, bye bye. See you. See you again in the afternoon. What time are we returning? Hello, Gori. When we are going to start? 2.30? Our time, 1.30. 1.30 it is. 1.30, okay. okay.